Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Finding Fandom. This one is a special one I believe because this is the first one that features someone that is not only a comic book collector at heart here on YouTube. And uh, it is none other than Tyler from Super Squad D. And I had a great time talking with Tyler before, during and after the interview. I mean, he has so much energy, the guy, you have no idea. And he's very well spoken as he knows his fan very well and is very, very passionate about his hobbies. And you can't feel but just get energized by that, by talking with him about it. As well as we got into the talk, you know, about FOMO and everything. And I want to know his side of it. And yeah, I just had a great time and I got a lot of value out of that interview with him as well as I want to join in on more of his live streams now because I just want to be pumped up with all that energy that surges through his channel. And as you know, links are down below already. But first, check out this interview with Tyler from Super Squad D. What's up, man? What's up, doing? dude? Good. Thank you for having me on the show, dude. Thank you for being here. Is this one of the most anticipated episodes yet on Finding Fandom? Well, it's certainly one of the most anticipated for me because I'm I'm super excited to be here. Nobody ever wants me to be on their show. Like I have to pay people to be on their show. I'm like, all right, Omni Bros, here's some money. Let me hop in. Omar, here's some money, dude. This is like <laughs> the first time anyone's ever asked me to be on. I, I don't I think that's a total lie. <laughs> it is. It's a lie. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I could barely get in line, so <laughs> but, 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 here but here we are. But here we are. And yeah. Uh for you that don't know, this is finding fandom with Super Squad D, where the D stands for dude, finally. We're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I've been following your channel, I think, ever since it came up, actually. And you've been sort of a, can I say, side character to the oh, Omnibus sure. Live? Yeah, and for sure. Omnibus Vault with Jess Bragg. I mean, this dude just shows up. I don't even know. Maybe he has three or four accounts other than <laughs> the ones I know of. But I like to play the side character, like that Kramer style role from Seinfeld, you know, who pops in, he's wacky for about five minutes and then pops back out. That's yeah, like, that's what you do. You do these uh, phone calls with Jess in the beginning of yeah. um, Saturday, Saturdays on Saturdays with Whoa. Jess Bragg and Taylor Brown. And both of them has, of course, been on Finding Phantom previously. But yeah, I think that's where I heard of you first that's so funny there's someone calling it. him doing the close to a mark hamill impression that he can yeah <laughs> yeah yeah doing the joker uh <laughs> sounds great dude i need i need one of those for my uh answering machine so good dude i love i love voice impressions i love doing different characters i love calling and leaving people voicemails uh just randomly as as different characters or repertoire it's, it's fun for me. It's, you can tell that there's a lot going on in here that but doesn't make sense, but it is fun to me. How many voices are in that? No, that's not a real question. No, it's not real. There's seven. There's I mean, seven. technically there's six. One of them is a deaf mute voice. It's a little hard to understand, but you know, it's, you know, it's fine. It's cool. We all, everyone's happy in there. It's fine. Oh, great. I'll, I'll just speak to one of you at a time here. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I usually start off with the easiest question just to yeah. get it all rolling. How, Tyler, did you discover comic books? So when I was a kid, Spider-Man the Animated Series, Batman the Animated Series, and X-Men the Animated Series were pretty much life for me. Uh, of course, and Power Rangers. Those, those were like my after-school shows in the second grade, third grade. And uh, around the time of the fourth grade, I had a friend named Oliver Hodge in, in class with me. And he said, dude have you read these comics? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, you got to go check out these comic books. My mom bought them for me at the dollar store. 
And I was like, oh, cool. What are they? And he showed them to me. And they were, uh, it was a, it was a three pack of mini series. The first three issues of Frank Miller's Daredevil, the man without fear. And they had nice. two, three packs at the Dollar Tree or the dollar store for a dollar a piece. So I got all six issues for two bucks. My mom took me, picked them up, totally changed my life. I just thought they were the awesomest thing. And then it was an easy segue for me from the shows that I loved. Of course, Spider-Man being my favorite character and yeah. the show being my favorite to comics. And, and that was, you know, that was kind of back in the day where, uh, well, obviously I, I couldn't drive because I was in the fourth grade, but <laughs> it was hard to get a hold of comics and there wasn't all these online places you could order. So I remember I got a few issues of comics. I got Young Justice and I got uh, Impulse with Bart Allen yeah. and Superboy and Spider-Man. Those four books, I remember cutting out in the actual book, cutting <laughs> out the little mail-in form where you write a check and you sign up for 12 issues and they mailed the issues to your house. Nice. It was awesome. Absolutely loved it, dude. Do you still have that subscription? No. <laughs> I wish. That was amazing. I remember like going to the mailbox, so excited to get my new issue of comics in, bring it to school, show all my friends. Yeah, I used, to, that, I used to have a mail subscription also to some Swedish comic books. We didn't have much superheroes. We did have some that were, I mean, dubbed or subbed into translated yeah. into into, <laughs> into Swedish. I mean, and of course the, the shows also were dubbed and everything. But I mean, then there's the collector mind that comes into it when it comes to reselling those issues. Now I have my freaking address and name stamped on the backside of this <laughs> because that's how you did back yeah, then. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Absolutely. Um, oh yeah, being a collector is a whole nother side of it. I think that there are yeah. I think that you are either born a collector or you're not. Uh, I wish at times I wasn't because it doesn't really seem to matter what it is, but I just seem to go full stop like 110 miles an hour to collecting anything that is cool. Like I remember as a kid, this was before comic books, I collected uh, baseball cards and football cards. And at that time, I didn't even care about baseball or football. I was just like, oh, cards, these are cool. I don't yeah. know who these people are, but let me get it. And uh that, of course, transitioned to comics, uh, which at some point transitioned to video games. And then, of course, uh, action figures as well. Is It just, it all kind of trickled together. And as you can see in the background here, like, uh, you got collector. You. I can't, I guess, I can't. I, I guess it's, I guess it's pretty impressive. Thank you. It's so <laughs> really. This is a flattering colors. Yeah. And as you said, we're very black and white, either you're, either you're a collector or not. But it doesn't have to be comic books, of course. Like you said, it's all yeah. different medium. And I'm thinking back and I'm looking at my friends and everything when visiting them and not judging my friends now, but uh, they're not actually, as you said, they're not really collecting anything. Yeah. If, if not something that I'm not seeing. And yeah, that's, I mean, mainstream media, you go to the gym, you eat your food, you have your uh dinners i guess and watch your tv shows but the collector in mind i mean it's a little more i want something to have my mind on a yeah. little more overall the time yeah yeah that's a good point about collecting like i think that uh, as a collector uh that there's certainly a mindset of not necessarily obsessiveness but certainly a mindset of focus that goes along with it where you're like okay these are my goals. Like, this is what I want to get to at some point. I want to collect these or I want to obtain these or I want to find these or track down these. And, uh, and you're just like tunnel visioned on those things. And it's just, it's why, in fact, hold on. This is something else I collected. I've got these here. This is hysterical. So my mom sent these home because she just like cleans out her attic and she's just like occasionally like, uh, sends stuff home. So this is, this is what a collector I was as a kid. Pogs. These, these are <laughs> this is my pogs collection that my mom sent home that apparently in the second grade I was obsessed with. And it's just if I can hold this up without spilling them everywhere, yeah. it's just nothing but pogs. Like I don't even know how you play pogs. It, they were slammer. I, I I was just gonna ask you, can you teach me how, what are like, the rules? What is the end goal? I, all I remember is there's these stack of cardboard pogs, and there's like these plastic slammers that all had like wacky designs on them. And you would like hit the pogs with the slammers. 
I don't know. I, it was just like, hey, kids, collect these things. You'll love them. And we were like, okay, we do yeah. love them. You're right. Let's get them. And then half a decade later comes Pokemon. Oh, which like just dominated everybody, right? Like, come yeah. On. I, I, I think that's the first obsessive thing that I got into collecting Pokemon cards. And you're six years old, I am, yeah. by that time. And you you can't read English. You don't know anything about <laughs> strategy point. games. So, so you don't use the things for the things that they're meant to be, which yeah. is to actually play them strategically with others. But everything, what everyone is bothered about then is I want the whole low ultra rare card oh yeah everything. for sure you're opening those packs the endorphin rush of like what you get and are you gonna get the sparkly charizard yeah, are you going to get the charizard is this it is this finally it it's dude because i'm when, with you when the base set released i mean from the set go that card was so hyped so hyped like crazy <laughs> And now it goes for millions of dollars. Uh, oh if only we had held on to those kinds of things. I never yeah. had one, but if I had, I, I, I remember I my first uh, holo card from the base set from Pokemon, and that was a holographic Gyarados. Oh, that's awesome, dude! Well, and, Magic Carp comes and, to and, and awesome. as a six-year-old, you know nothing about right. card sleeves. <laughs> right. <laughs> Or taking care of your cards. <sighs> yep. People used to flip them and say, if oh. mine ends up heads up, I win your card if yours heads down. <laughs> that's that's the battle of Pokemon. <laughs> Flipping the cards in the Flipping air. Flipping the cards, dude. I love that. That's amazing. And that is, of course, what made a lot of parents stop buying cards oh, for no their doubt. kids. No doubt. No doubt. You're not just giving away the cards that I spent my <laughs> right. precious money on. So that's the first lesson for me when it comes to collecting, I think. Yep. That's and, a good one. Yeah. I'm going to crack open a Dr. Pepper while we're chatting. Oh, there we have our first one. <laughs> it's a refreshing taste of Super Squad D where the D. I I mean, is it the same good. satisfaction feeling of opening a booster pack from any it's, card it's game series? That's right. It's the exact same feeling. You open that pack, you crap on that Dr. Pepper, the endorphins roll in your mind. It's so good. Yeah, and then you see what you get. And yeah, like, now, like, next one. <laughs> next pack. Let's just go to the next pack. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's buying a comic book, it's sort of the same thing, but a slower process because you have to read the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because there's an aspect of collecting that doesn't necessarily mean you have to read them. Now, I personally read my stuff because I love comic books, and I buy to read, but there are definitely collectors out there, speaking about that collector mentality, who want the book but don't necessarily care about reading it. And, and that might be because they like the artwork on the cover. And this is not necessarily about hardcovers, just comics in general. Like, I have friends who will go after these variants and these issues of comics that they're never going to read, but they just love the artwork. They like the rarity aspect of it. They may want to hold it for value one day as an investment. Um, and so they go after this. In fact, I do have a friend who collects omnibus, doesn't okay. read, oh. has no desire to read them. He just likes the way they look. He thinks they're cool. So he buys them. Holds on to him, fills his shelf with him, and he reads the occasional book. But like in he opens general, them up still. He he doesn't let them stay in a shrink wrap. He leaves them sealed. They are oh, sealed. Okay, okay. They, he leaves them all sealed. Is that not wild? I mean, a true collector. It's a from all the things that because we I don't think we ever talked about this when it comes to investing in uh, comic books and graphic novels. I. It's very rare to hear people talk about collected editions to yeah. invest in. More so single issue key issues. That's much more right. talked about, of course, in the community and, and seen. But to store that many, I don't know how many Omnibus your friend has, but with having 20 to 30, something like that, yeah. it takes up real estate. A lot and of space. space. Yeah, for sure. So here's here's what's interesting about that. He buys two of every omnibus. 
Okay. The same omnibus. He buys twice. One to keep and one to hold as an investment to sell. So he does read the material that he gets in, just not the same copy. So he doesn't read it either. Oh my God. <laughs> he holds one to keep for himself, holds one to, to keep as an investment. So he buys two and he will sell it once he can sell it for cover price or more, double what he invests, yeah. whatever he paid for it, because his goal is to have an entire collection for free. And so uh, far, it's actually worked like pretty okay. well. Now he's holding a bunch of books and he has to hold them for, you know, sometimes years before he can sell them. But his goal, so he buys two with the goal yeah. of selling one to pay for the other. Um, I mean, it, I should really wow. ask, I should really ask him about this because what, so he's building a runway of books. That's something that we all can yeah. agree on that we're doing when yeah. it becomes a backlog of books. You're, Ooh. you're building your path on a reading marathon yeah. or whatnot about a character. I myself, of course, try to always stay on the run whilst doing so by yeah. reading my books, of course, but not everybody has the time. And I can only speak for myself, of course, but I'm curious about others mannerisms about it also, of course. Um, so, I mean, for you personally, it's much easier to speak about to you about yeah. this, of course, you're the guest <laughs> of honor and everything. Uh, do you have a number on your collection? Maybe how many books you have achieved and how many are unread at the moment? Maybe I did this a while ago and I don't, I've got a video on my channel. It's, it's probably a few months old now and I'm going off of rough memory here, but at one, at some point early this year, I asked this, the, the scariest question I could ask myself as someone who both collects and reads, which is how much will I ever be able to read it all? Like yeah. I wanted to sit down with myself truthfully and say like, okay, part of me is a collector who wants to have this stuff as a collection, but part of me is a reader who actually loves these, the material, loves the books I don't buy anything that I'm not interested in reading at some point. So I had to ask myself the hard question at the current rate at which I'm buying and reading, yeah. am I going to actually read my whole collection before I die at some point? Or is it like if, if I continue on this path for 20 years and buy at the same rate and read at the same rate, obviously space will become an issue at some point, but yeah, theoretically, yeah, assuming obviously. That it, theoretically assuming that there's no space issues, would I ever read it all? And I, and I realized the answer was no. And so I thought, okay, something has to change. Either I have to stop buying as much or I have to start reading more if my goal is to read everything that I own. So I ended up counting up all the books. And at that time, I don't remember the total number. <clears throat> Excuse me. A round number. But I think at this point, I am around 250 to 260 omnibus. So I personally, I only get omnibus okay. or omnibus equivalent is what I would call them books. Yeah, so like, I understand what you mean. So, so it may not say the word omnibus on there, but it, it like, it's very clear with the same size, has a big bulk of material yeah. for all intents and purposes. It is an omnibus, even though it doesn't say it. Exactly. Uh, there's around 260 and when I broke, I, I wanted to do some statistical breakdowns of, specifically like Marvel DC independent mm -hmm. and read percent. And what I remember roughly was I was around 40 to 45% read percent on my Marvel and DC books, somewhere around there. Yeah. So, so about half of the yeah, collection. Close in to half of what I had, I had already read. Yeah. And the independent stuff was significantly less. It was around 30 to 35%. Uh, I had read. Now that actually has gone up quite a bit. The independent number has probably gone up, whereas the Marvel number and DC number may have gone down slightly because throughout this year, I've actually read a significant amount of independent books Good. more than my Marvel and DC, but I'm still purchasing Marvel and DC. So I'm not really sure. I would guess right now my collection at a snapshot is probably around 40% all around. I've probably read about 40% of my collection. And 60% is unread at this point. Yeah. And I can totally relate to that question about will I ever be able to read it all? But 
I'm at another question, and that is, will I ever be able to reread it all? Yeah. Because I I have, for this recording sake, during this time when we do this, I have 13 books in my unread pile, which are the copies of books that I bought in and then never opened for the purpose of reading them. Mm -hmm. And half of them, I think, collects materials that I've already read in another format. Yeah. So that's, that's why I'm not stressing to those per se. But there are a few of them, six or seven, that has material that is new material. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing these reading marathons in order to, for every lap that you take, you get one new book with you for that yeah. uh, lap. So, for example, right now reading uh, Batman, and I just started the Grant Morrison Volume 1. And nice. I've never read Volume 3 ever since I bought it, but I've read the material in it uh, four times before wow. in, in some other format yeah. because it's been yeah. collected in deluxe size right. and absolute format. And it just for every lap that I take with rereading my stuff, it gets a richer experience as well yeah. as I'm trying to be an essentialist with the books and try to figure out what books of Batman do I really enjoy and want to reread right. on the next lap. And if I don't want to have it for, to reread and waste some time, I sell it off, earn That's some money really to good. buy the next book. That's a great metric for you like to personally have. I, I think it's really important when you have a collection to set parameters and boundaries of like, okay, this is how I'm going to collect. Because if you don't, like, it's just overwhelming and there's there's too much. So like for you, for example, uh, the reread is a big part of your collection. Like the books yeah, you want to have are books you want to reread. You don't want to have them if you don't want to reread them. For yeah. me, uh, I because I have so much unread, I feel like I don't have time to reread as much as I would want to. But I mean, th that's the thing you start to think about once you've read it all. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But for me, uh, my in terms of what I want to purchase and have, the reason that I've chosen the omnibus and omnibus equivalent format is because it's is simply aesthetics. Like, I love the way they yeah. look on the shelf. It's not all that I read, though. So I actually read a significant amount of books digitally. Oh. Um, and that's just really for convenience sake and for storage sake, I don't really have a good place to put individual books and, and aesthetically speaking, I just enjoy the feel and the look of the omnibus as opposed yeah. to like a trade paperback though trade paperbacks, I find to be the most enjoyable physical reading experience just because they're convenient. Uh, so yeah. what ends up happening is I'll read a lot digitally. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned just a second ago, uh, you purchase a lot of stuff that you've already read because you love the material. I do the same thing with Omnibus. Like if I've read, for example, Snyder Batman Volume 2, yeah, I'm going to buy it even though I've already read it because I want to have the book because I love it. And you want book. to reread it someday. And at some point, I would totally reread it. Absolutely reread yeah. it. And that's, that's kind of uh, a big part of why I purchase stuff as well. You mentioned the aesthetics on collecting omnibus before it and i totally support that because I, if you've seen my shelves i know i'm in the kitchen right now so you can't see anything <laughs> really. and i haven't uploaded in, in a picture to show on that but or maybe i do i loved your video you made your minimalist the last one you made uh, a different I background I, we, oh, we're in the way know. right now but <laughs> i mean this is from my old apartment yeah so i don't even have this much shelf space anymore yeah. i have um, two wide billies and one thin one in between them so cool. it's the real estate of almost 18 of these shelf rows okay yeah which sounds like a lot but really like you have to be pretty particular about what you, what you yeah, did. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we, I don't know when, when you started reading or, or purchasing these oversized formats, but for me, it was in 2016. And at that time, Marvel was releasing like one a month, you know, two yeah. a month. And so it was like, 
not a big deal to get get them because like it didn't take up that much space. Mm -hmm. But now they're releasing 20 a month. Yeah. And and if you want multiple books, like suddenly you're faced with a very like a a very real dilemma of space. Like that becomes a real constraint. But that can be a good thing. You know, people often talk about it as a bad way, but we were talking before the show about how constraints can be a good thing in life because they can help you focus on what's important and focus on something what on on what you uh, really want to do. That's something that I think nobody inherently likes constraints in life. Nobody likes being told what to do or that they can't do something. No one likes those rules or boundaries, but it's interesting that we actually as people thrive under rules and boundaries uh, in, you know, in a healthy way when, when the rules are healthy and the boundaries are healthy and they're reasonable, we actually thrive. And so I think that really helps you. Like you have a very great view of what you want to collect and that is reinforced by your space limitations. And, and that's really, I think a healthy thing as, as well as it is for most collectors. Yeah. Because taking the, okay. Stepping aside from the comic book collecting for, for, for a while, then just when we talk about, uh, real estate and space and everything, if you think just in the way that we live, we, we don't live in a, we never build for ourselves these days. I mean, we get a space that we can afford for the money check that we get. And so we, we adjust it to that check. We never think, okay, I can take a smaller space because I don't need as much. You take, most of the time people choose the biggest space that they can afford. Yeah. And then to that space, they decorate it as much as they have real estate. And not necessarily because they have to or that they need the stuff, but it's just yeah. that's the space that they have. So now I need to fill it. But what if it's the other way around and you just you get to a place and then start building up with the things that you actually need and then you'll realize how much space you actually need? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's interesting I'm sure we all have things in our life and you probably do a lot better about this than most people, but we all have things in our life. I'm not perfect. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have things in our life where uh, we go well beyond what we need. I know I'm the chief offender there of having way more than I need. Obviously, Definitely done that. the omnibus, nobody, but uh, the idea that people will live up to their means, mm-hmm. I think is very real and is actually a very big problem, especially financially. Now I'm for my job, uh, I'm in the financial arena. And one of the the biggest mistakes I see people making with their money and their finances, if not the single biggest mistake, uh, other than not saving enough for taxes is that when they get a bigger paycheck, they have, they find ways to spend it. I remember uh, a client telling me one time, Oh, if I made $200,000 a year, I would not know. I would, what would I do with the money? I would just have so much money. And then suddenly yeah. they reach that threshold and the money's gone because yeah. they, they spend it. And the biggest two areas I found where people get in trouble are houses and cars because they buy a yeah. big house, they buy a new car because at the time they think oh, I can make these monthly payments. They're not looking at the cost overall over a 30 year period or exactly. you know financing the interest on a vehicle. They're just going, well, yeah, I can make these monthly payments. Sure. And that ends up, coming back to bite them because they don't have the freedom to do things that they want to do because they're so constrained by that because they feel that constraint, they feel up to their means. And so it's a really interesting point that you make. And I think one that really will resonate with a lot of people and hit home that if you will control the big things in your life like that, you can oftentimes have freedom to do some of the other stuff. And that's not true for everybody, but uh, but, but it's certainly still, true for a lot of people, I think. It's a very good point and very true for a lot of people. I I was starting to think when you mentioned cars and houses about the hedonic treadmill of earning more money because now we say, we say you I don't know, what's an average paycheck? Maybe $500? So is that too low? Probably, long? yeah. No, I, I don't know. Probably $500? Yeah, I think it's probably Let, average. Let's say, let's say $500. Five, every two weeks? I don't know, three weeks? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say that. that. 
so and you live by your means and you think that oh if i only got maybe 200 more bucks every yeah. second week i would be able to be so much more happier because then i could afford this thing and start yeah. buying that and then you get that raise you get that paycheck but the thing is since you now are adjusting to mm -hmm. the inflation you start to go into the new normal because now it's into your life now it's just your regular paycheck again yeah it's not a raise and Thanks to the hedonic treadmill, this is the reason why people buy a second car because you get yeah. those endorphins of my brand new car and I love it. Yeah. You want to hunt for that feeling again, mm -hmm. yeah, which can only be met by another bigger car. Definitely, and that is what throws you in the ditch. Yeah, and I think end. that we see that uh, on a on a more personal level in our collecting at times, yeah. you know, it's always, you get, uh, you get that endorphin rush and that high from getting the next new thing that you want, which lasts for a very short time yeah. because now that you've got it, you're not as next excited one. about it. You just want the next thing. And so then you get the next thing and you're like, Oh, that's super awesome. If I could just get this, then you get it. And then you're like, Oh, but this other book's coming out that I really want. And you've still got the three books that you just bought that you were so excited about sitting exactly. on the floor. And so because you like, buy so much faster than you read. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because of that mentality. It can be not always, but it can be because of that mentality. Uh, so I think that's a really good point and something I think we have to really watch in ourselves. I know I have to watch in myself. Like, am I just buying this because I don't want to feel good? or I want to feel that rush of getting something or is this something that I really want and I, and I truly want to get and value uh, because yeah. I know I'm guilty of the other for sure at times. And I'm thinking about the influences around us that, makes us want to buy something because yeah and this is the total hypocritical f f thing and question that i'm taking up because i myself <laughs> as making youtube videos and by the way buying omnibus since 2012 <laughs> i think yeah, there you but, go let's go but as i said <laughs> it's not the same distribution size because it has quadrupled with much more releases week after week and the thing is now it was the the thing, as we said, with comparison to others, also keeping up with the Joneses and everything. You want to have what your neighbor has, but now your neighbor is the world, thanks to YouTube and Instagram. Yeah, we see what <laughs> That's people. That's a good point, dude. We see what people yeah. are buying, and we don't. Yeah, they not necessarily document what they have read. I mean, I try yeah. to do review monthly review videos now instead of haul videos because I want to show people that side and talk about the books yeah, because it's great instead of just showing up a book say this looked great so i bought it i'd rather yeah. pick it up when i said that i've read it and this is what i thought about it people that's a can, really good idea people can get more information out of it if they really think that they want to buy it by those words yeah and i think that's a really good point about the world being your neighbor and suddenly the advent of social media and this is like obviously a, a, a long discussion topic that we don't have to go down but the idea that like social media in general as well as influencers yeah. and things like that have actually led to a lot of dissatisfaction and, and lower of levels of happiness as opposed to the opposite because you're constantly seeing the you're seeing the version of someone that they want to put out there but that is not necessarily them so they're like taking a picture at the beach and they're like oh this is amazing my life is great but really their life may be falling apart but you see that picture of the beach and you're like well they're at the beach i should be at the beach like i want to go to the beach and so it <laughs> it breeds this um almost this envy yearning for happiness me. yeah this yeah this yearning for happiness this envy this questioning of like well, why don't i have these things uh and and you never know i i laugh all the time because i, I tell this story about uh, there was a client that we had that was just totally bankrupt. He was leveraged up to his eyeballs in debt, tons of, you know, outstanding loans. And uh, my dad was actually at lunch, who I work with. He was at lunch and he overheard some people at the table next to him talking about how rich this person was. Oh, so rich. Yeah, he's got this two huge cars and a beach house and you wouldn't. Oh, he's so rich. And my dad just chuckling to himself thinking like, you have no idea. Like, this guy's actually about to lose his business because uh, what you have on the outside and what you portray doesn't necessarily reflect the, the your status. Like as in, 
your financial status. And so exactly. you can look at someone and go, oh, wow, they have 250 omnibus. They have 500 omnibus. They have a collection of a thousand keys. They must be super rich. And I should have that. But what you may not realize is they may be up to debt in their eyeballs or they may be, uh, you know, yeah, who knows what's going on behind the scenes. And so when we turn off this interview, we're miserable. Yeah, we hate it. We hate ourselves. This is awful. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it's, uh, like, it's not healthy to fall into the comparison trap and to exactly. look at other people and say, oh, that's what I need. But it is hard to not do that. Like yeah, in a practical sense, when you're scrolling your Facebook feed, like it can be really hard to not do that. So yeah, definitely be conscious about it. What I've done, because now with the change of mindset, I still have my videos up of graphic novel collection and everything. So I know yeah. that I display a certain face on what a collection could look like. But I'm each and every time that I get a comment on like my update from 2018 with 900 plus books, I always say, thank you for watching and everything, but know that this is not the goal. This is not the dream or whatever yeah. they comment on it because I get concerned because now I feel that I, for myself with my content, I want to take more responsibility of what face that I put out. Not yeah, saying that you shouldn't post a graphic novel collection video or, or a haul sure. video. It's all in the message of fun. I think we're still doing it, but yeah. also we are influencing each other. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point. Definitely. DC and Marvel does not do commercials because we do it for them. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? My goodness. I mean, no it's, not, words. it's not a chance out there that they are not, uh, that they're unaware of us, that there's a comic book YouTube community. Oh yeah, they know. They love it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I mean, they know that we egg our, each other into yeah. buying more stuff. Whether sure. it's on purpose or not. Yeah, definitely agree. Definitely agree. That's why going back to what we're talking about, constraints are a good thing. Yeah. Those natural constraints of life that we want to fight so hardly against are actually usually a good thing. Now, that's not true for all constraints and for all of life. There's certainly a minimum level that you have to live, be, live in. I mean, obviously, yeah. but there are, for most of us, I would say the constraints end up being a good thing, even though we don't like them. Yeah. And I, I bring up a lot of stuff on it on my channel and everything about FOMO, you know, if you're missing out and oh, everything. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's basically the whole channel. is either that or minimalism, but I didn't want to convert in this channel into minimalism 100% because that's already out there, believe me. Yeah. But I was thinking if I could just pinpoint and talk to people on just this area, comic books, yeah. because I noticed that people are, you know, bu buying up more than they can read and then just selling it, it all off because they yeah. can't keep up. This is too much money. But there's a way to actually go about this and it's yeah. not rushing through it. The, the only nice thing about that is. Thank goodness these omnibus usually retain their value pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. So, so at least you can always rest in the fact that like if you've got some omnibus, you're almost never going to lose money. Uh, you can no. almost always sell it for what you paid for or oftentimes significantly more uh, if you need to. That's the only, that's the only nice like. And now we have exactly. reprints also. Yeah. Oh gosh. Everything gets reprinted. Yeah. There's, there's very little reason to buy a whale at this point, at least from Marvel exactly. for sure, because like everything gets reprinted, dude. Like it's crazy. Yeah, it's awesome. Though. I love it. DC, we have the, the silent reprints or whatever. Yeah. And now they're actually getting out some reprints that they have announced. At least by this video, next year we're getting some highly popular titles like the Gotham Central. Yeah. That's and great. lesser known. Teen Titans by Jeff Johns and the 52 so Weekly series. Yeah. All of which I have recently read <laughs> just this week. That's awesome, off. dude. And of course, this is way in the past now when this is shown up oh, yeah. in the feed. But still, I, I just want to brag a little to my friend here. <laughs> That's awesome. I I have been wanting to read Gotham Central. I just haven't gotten to it yet. I love never read it by John. I never read it once, even not a single issue. 
Okay. Yeah, then I've heard it's great, in, though. And I've got you're in for a treat. I've heard it's really good. But I, I love John's Teen Titans. Huge place in my heart. Uh, I had the whole run in singles, and then I, I bought the omnibus. And then nice. uh, I also enjoyed 52. I thought that was really fun, the weekly series. I had that in singles when it came out also. Yeah. So, so and reading all those books, it was in the process of my Batman marathon, actually, as <laughs> it sort of winded out, you know? Yeah. Uh, because I, I was thinking so, pretty much every event crosses over with Batman at one point, point at a time. And I was just thinking, might as well bring all of those titles yeah. into this and go back and forth with it. I, I had to stop reading Teen Titans for, uh, two times because it intercepted with uh, Infinity Crisis and yeah. then read maybe two or three issues. Then I had to read the 52 <laughs> because it's one year later, which yeah. the 52 weekly series yeah. takes up all the time. Oh, for. man. Batman is in everything, dude. Even the, even the toys. Like, Batman is everywhere. Yeah. I, He's just, he's popular, man. Everyone loves Batman. I have no problem with Batman getting <laughs> his space, but I, I'm, he, he definitely gets too much sometimes. Yeah. But I'm, it, not, I'm not complaining. As long as you can find your stick to it, what you want to acknowledge and read. That's right. And buy. And yeah, let's see here. Super Squad D, also known as SSD Toys, on Instagram, right? Indeed. And sh don't call them toys, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're action figures. Yeah. You can call them toys as long as you don't call them dolls. That's where I draw <laughs> the line. They're not dolls. I mean, yes, they have clothes, okay, technically, and accessories. <laughs> Okay, I see you, you. You're thinking they're like dolls, but they're not dolls. I mean, could a doll do this? Look, a doll doesn't look like this. Come on, it's a great cable. That's like nothing we got when we grew up. Yeah, ain't that the truth? You got a good cable. I'm just looking at like the few things that are on my desk here. Uh, you know, we got a rad Doctor Doom. His little nice. magic book. And what run is that from with, with White Cloak? So that was from the Secret Wars with oh, the yeah. God Emperor Doom uh, with the Secret Wars event. that I think that was in 2016. I can't remember. Is it already? Oh, God, five years. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Hard to believe. And then we got this cool Aries. You know, there's just all kinds of cool nice. figures. The cloth cape. Yeah, it's just... I love I love them, man. I love love action figures. Big fan of the photography. Big fan of uh, posing them and setting up scenes and all that fun stuff. I, yeah. I I discovered I always really enjoyed collecting. Obviously, as we talked about collecting action figures, and I I really didn't. I I mean, I stopped buying figures probably when I was ten. Didn't buy any more figures. Until 2012, I was on my way to Birmingham, Alabama, and I stopped in a Toys R Us in Meridian, Mississippi, and I looked down, and I saw a Thor action figure, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. I wonder if if there's a review for this, because that's what I do. I look up a review for everything. I'm like, I, yeah. can't, buy any, I can't buy a $5 toaster without reading 10 reviews. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. So I was like, I wonder if there's a review for this. And I, I went to a website called itsalltrue.net, which was an action figure review site at the time. Uh, and I and they gave it a really good review. And so I said, you know what? I'm just going to buy it. This looks cool. I don't know anything about it. And that was the beginning of thousands of action figures, I'm sure, at this point. And uh, I just, I love collecting. And so I had them and they sat on the shelf for a while. But my biggest problem with them was, again, going back to what we talked about earlier in that collecting mentality of, okay, I'm, I really want this. And then when yeah. I get it now, I just really want this and I already yeah. have this and it's just going to sit here. So like I would get a figure in, I'd be like, this is so awesome. And then it goes in on a shelf and then I never think about it again. So one of the things that I really discovered during the pandemic was I, I had done this before, maybe five years ago, but not seriously. And I discovered that I really enjoyed taking each figure I got in 
and taking photos with it because that helped me nice. enjoy the figure in a way that uh, I found gratification and satisfaction in. And it helped me feel like it was making the purchase a little bit more worth it to me. And like I was really getting my money's worth by, by buying some of these figures. And so I decided to make a goal at that time, which was, maybe this was like, I guess the beginning of the this year where I said, you know what? I really want to take a picture with every figure that I buy. Every nice. figure that comes in the door, I want to take a photo of some kind with. That's and a very that, good rule. And that really set off a really fun journey for me because it, it helped me express myself creatively, which I do think I'm a creative person. Uh, other people might not think that, but I think that like, I think of myself as a creative type person who wants to express their passions in Absolutely. a way that connects with people, whether that's through a YouTube video talking about something I love, like comic books or, or action figures, or whether that's through creating music, which I used, used to do a good bit of, uh, or, you know, acting. I, I love to act. I love to be in plays. I love to be in movies. Uh, there was just a long list of things that I enjoy doing that, ultimately center around creating something and then sharing that with people, that aspect of myself with people. And so action figure photography became a great way for me to do that in a way that was satisfying. It was helping me meet my goals of collecting the figures and also uh, was something I could do safely during the pandemic from my own home. Okay. So let's check out some of these pictures that you've taken throughout. I mean, you sent me so many, dude. But I, I mean, I said I'll I'll take some favorites, but I mean, I, I can't decide. I, I just take everything. <laughs> and how how long would you say that it, the span has been from taking all of these photos? So I have taken photos. I think since February of this year, March, sometime in there, is when I really started doing this more seriously and honing my honing the craft and leveling up my skills and things like that. And my, I think every single week, but one, nice. no, I think every week since then, actually I've posted five photos a week oh, minimum. So, so I try to post almost every day, a new photo on my Instagram page, uh, which has uh, had some pretty, pretty cool growth. And I actually end up, end up doing a lot of uh, video content on Instagram now, which is where I find a lot of my, my action figure content. And uh, I've really enjoyed connecting with some other people over on Instagram because I never really used Instagram before this. And I've enjoyed mm -hmm. connecting with some other people on Instagram. Uh, I also used TikTok for a little while, but discovered that was just like not my thing. Like it was fun. Uh, yeah. I posted a video on there that got like 100,000 views the first like week I put it up. And, uh, and then I just... I just don't enjoy TikTok like as a platform. So at least you tried it. I mean, I have I haven't tried it, and I, I don't think it's the platform for me, and that's why yeah. I never did. But maybe curiosity will strike, and I'll yeah. test it out. But I mean, if you're comfortable, it, it's it's nothing wrong with being comfortable with your platform. Yeah, and I really love Instagram. Like I have really fallen in love with uh, the way that Instagram certainly seems to be a good place for photographers and Absolutely. <laughs> and for short form video content, which is what I usually do. So I do one photo and one video every day. And so, and the video is usually a behind the scenes of the photo. So it kind of yeah, showcases see like also. how I did the shot, like what the scene looked like, what the lighting looked like and things like that. And it's been That's really it. fun to have good feedback and some good response over there. So let's look at this one then. So we can have an example here. And yeah, I'll that was actually the most recent one that I took. That hasn't gone up on my Instagram yet. So this is a big preview here. I mean, not really because this is weeks <laughs> after it probably. <laughs> true, true. At this point, it hasn't gone up. Uh, that was, I, I had a blast taking this photo. So I sent you the video of it yep. because I wanted you to see just how deep the setup is because this setup actually takes the entire dining room table. It's very layered. There's okay. a bunch of like diorama pieces and buildings in the background, but I just had a blast making miles swinging through the city. I just thought it would be really fun. And I thought the reflection on the car was cool and it was a total accident. 
but I loved it. So I was like, it's really you. good. And if I shut this down and we'll show this. Yeah, here's the video. That's right. So this is uh, the whole setup here. Kind of just how all the I layering. I was thinking about that. I mean, stuff on stuff so on stuff. Cool. And then there's all these little ice cream box or what that now is <laughs> holding up a tree. I mean, the stuff that you don't see and that you get away with to yeah. make this sort of depth into the scene yeah it's really, it was, remarkable. It's really fun that's that's probably my favorite aspect of of action figure photography is creating a scene trying to create an environment that looks real for the universe you're, you're taking a shot in those are the things that i really enjoy about uh, about it it's really fun and it's it's just fun because i have a, I have a very add personality Okay. In, in all aspects of life, but certainly like when I read, like I'll read Batman and then I can't read another Batman book. I got to go to something else. Okay. And I just kind of cycle. And that's what I do with my figure photography as well. Like I'll take a picture of Miles, you know, swinging through that city scene. Yeah. And then the next picture I take, I've got over here is Luigi being chased by a bunch of ghosts in the woods, like totally different. Uh, did you then, send that to me? Because if you did, we have it here somewhere. Let's see. I didn't send you that one because I haven't taken it yet. The Luigi. Oh, okay, one. okay, but, okay. Uh, but uh, we do have a bunch of other scenes. I think that I sent you that I just. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Let's see here. This. Oh, nice. Yeah, here was a a, a shot of the Joker just kind of walking through an alleyway where there's a guy in the background laying on the ground, like Joker killed him, and there's fire. And uh, one of the things oh, very... that I think is very popular on Instagram is kind of the muted colors. And like the very cinematic feel. And for me, I just love the exact opposite. Like there's nothing wrong with that. I do enjoy those. But for me, I love the vibrance. Very I love rich. the color pop. And so that's kind of, I look for photos and ways to take photos that are going to really highlight the color. So here's a picture of, of a Mezco Joker that I just, I, this is, I really like this photo. And then you... <laughs> edit in some or I, I get i presume that you edit in this you don't print these out these Those word are bubbles. actually printed out every you every word bubble you see is printed out for me okay i thought so, you photoshopped those in yeah so that's actually a, a printout of word bubbles in fact i've got some uh right here where i've got a little packet of word bubbles here well there you go and, you know, they all say different things and we won't go through them all, but it's like, you know, this is like, I'm doing what needs to be done. We've got some sound effects here. Uh, you know, just random, random stuff that is just, nice. it's, I try my best to be yeah. as practical as possible in my photography. And it's not always 100% practical. Like what you see on the screen is not straight from the camera there is some color grading involved yeah of course and things like that and and sometimes i try my best not to do this but occasionally i will re digitally remove a stand that if the figures on like the first shot we saw of miles swinging through the city oh yeah i didn't think about that but i try my best to be as practical as possible uh, because i just think that it's from a creative standpoint it's it's more i don't want to say impressive but it's certainly is an additional level of skill. Um, of and, and that's something that I just, I really enjoy doing. You know, I think of like my favorite movies and this is kind of where I go with that. Like I think of my favorite, like Lord of the Rings, the yeah. practical effects of Lord of the Rings with the suits and everything yeah. were incredible. And then I compare that to the CG of the Hobbit and it just, I, it, I just love the practical aspect of it. And so I kind of try my best to be as practical as possible. Uh, it's not always possible, there's certainly some things you can't do practically. And so I, I definitely do some digital editing on my photos, but uh, I do but try to be practical. But it also helps with the creativity as you set this goal that you have, want to do exactly. as much practical as you said. Let's see, we have some, some more here. Let's see. Here. I, I like this shot. Yeah, that Superman. was uh, Superman leaving the watchtower was kind of my vision for the shot, like where he's like flying down from the watchtower and you got the clouds in the background and uh, that that shot was a that was a fun one i really had a lot of what fun do you use if, to, to get the background there i mean is it so, a computer screen or so TV? sometimes it's a computer screen i have a poster board of clouds it's, okay. it's, it's actually over there that i put up so sometimes it's a poster board of clouds 
And then there's just depth that blurs it. Sometimes it's a computer screen. It kind of depends. It, you will see some other shots that I sent you that have a computer screen background, but it, it kind of depends on, you know, on the setting and the scene. Hmm. But one of the things that I really like is to use a computer screen because it's just really convenient when you can find a bunch of different backgrounds and put yeah, them up and blur them out. Of course. Uh, let's see. Oh, where's the get down? This one uh, went up on my Instagram today, actually, which is, you know, three weeks ago if you're watching this video live. <laughs> but uh, Or a month. Or a month, could be. Uh, this was obviously Iron Man and War Machine. And then an Ant-Man, a really tiny Ant-Man figure. Uh, I, I just really loved all three of these figures. That's a real word bubble. That's a physical yeah. word bubble that I, saw you know, I stuck on there. Uh, in this photo particularly, though, the eyes are digital. So ah. I went in and, and put the white in the eyes. The rest of it is all practical. Are they not white on the toy itself otherwise? They are not. So here's the actual figure. I just happen to have it here. So here's the actual figure, and it's just kind of like ah. empty eyes. So uh, I, I just – I like the way that the the white eyes those those are the effects that I will almost always do, which is the eyes, the white eyes, or a lightsaber effect, because ah. like just the plastic saber is not nearly as cool. Right, like right there, I put in the uh, the lightsaber effect as Darth Maul is interrogating the guy on the ground and force choking the guy in the background, holding him up. Yeah, uh, I, I put in the lightsaber effect, and then. I put a red light on the back side of him to have that little part of the to give the effect of a saber. Yeah. Exactly. Lit up. And I just I'm a I'm a big fan of color pop. This this was a fun one for me. Uh the concept here is that Michelangelo gave Raphael an action figure of himself. And he and is very is he angry or is he like he's super very shocked? Stoked? He's very shocked to realize that they think he's the rude one. That uh -huh. think, that he's reading the description and he says, what do you mean I'm the rude one? And I thought this was some sort of existential crisis. What do you mean we are a exactly. figure of How is this possible? I just love that. And I love the expressiveness of those figures. These are definitely some of my favorite Ninja Turtle figures for sure. What and did you little... do to add on the eyebrows? So that actually, believe it or not, is all part of the figure. These figures came what? with all those faces, and they look exactly like that. There's no digital editing involved okay. in this photo, uh, other than a little color grading. But the mouth as well. That's the mouth it came with. It is. is can you believe it? Is that not no. hilarious? It's just so funny. I I'm, I'm that. thinking in sense of purpose for the toy right? in any action or playability <laughs> with it so it came with two heads one was like the normal head and then one was that head and same with like all the turtles they all came with like one very expressive head and then okay. one just like normal style head yeah because that that's what i would assume right that the toy yeah. would come with <laughs> let's see we have i mean we have a, a lot of picks here Let's see here. Yeah, so this is is Deadpool. He was very upset over waiting for UPS to deliver his toys. So huh. he took matters into his own hands and decided to go find the truck and get his toy. And uh, he wanted to be disguised. So he decided to put a mask <laughs> over his face and no one recognized him. So he's nice. knocked out the UPS driver in the back there. And just a wild guess, but for some reason, the UPS m man is loki himself yeah that's right he's you know he's, this is one of the random variants of loki who's trying to blend in and uh his <laughs> background is the ups guy that's really nice and yes i mean with these pictures and i mean for for me just knowing that it's loki it could could have been any civilian really right most of the figures i mean are based on some major character exactly probably. but you you get this story out of everything that you include within this picture because you you notice the logo sign the mask and everything so it's cross dimensions because this is not marvel and, and right. such and such right yep i uh i enjoy storytelling and so i try my best to tell some kind of a story with every photo hopefully that will either make someone laugh 
or connect with them in a way that they can understand and think is, is cool or creative because that's, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with taking a picture of just the figure by itself. And I do some of that, some portrait work, but usually I try to do some type of a scene, whether it's a fighting scene or a character thinking or something like that. Let's see this one. Let's yeah. So this, this was, this is one of my favorite photos that I took because I had this scene in my mind for two months. So I knew the figure was out and I ordered it and I began to think of this idea. I wanted to have Popeye on the beach. That was all I knew, kind of like shipwrecked on the beach or relaxing on the beach. And, and that was it. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up finding these little accessories, like the binoculars there, the map on the ground, the barrels I found. Uh, and then of course the fire and, and I got this sticks and these logs and I got some trees to put in there. And I just began to craft this scene and this idea in my head that like Popeye's on a, on a beach and he's killed some fish and he's grilling them over the fire. Those fish were like a dollar from the dollar store. I just poke a hole in them and stuck a stick in them. And then the <laughs> background here was we were talking about earlier. This is actually a screen. Uh, it, it ah. was, it was easier to find a picture of like the ocean with waves and the sand is called kinetic sand, which is just something that my kid has that she plays with. So okay, okay. I was like, daddy needs this for a picture. <laughs> You'll get it back. That's right. You'll get it back. Don't worry. So that was, that was one that I just really had a lot of fun. I felt a, a deep personal satisfaction because you ever have these ideas in your mind, whether it's for like a video oh, or definitely. something you want to create and you kind of know the general idea of what you want to do, but not specifically like, oh, this is exactly what it's going to look like in the end. And you just think about it and, and work it out. It's just really satisfying to, to have that and then to accomplish it in a way that you feel good about. Yeah, definitely. I have several videos of that. And then, then it's, of course, also blended with the expectation that I want for the video also. But I try yeah. to be, I mean, as, as well with your photos, uploading them on Instagram, being satisfied with it before the upload should yes. be enough before you start counting and views and everything. That- that's something that is so important for me personally in creating any kind of content. I think for a long time as a content creator, I, I think I got discouraged by not reaching a level that I felt like I should be at when I would compare myself to other people, whether it was YouTubers, musicians, actors, or photographers in this case. Yeah. But one thing a long time ago that I really began, I, I really worked hard at developing in myself was a sense of satisfaction with myself and just saying like, you know what? I'm happy with the way these photos look like. I love these photos. Yeah. I poured myself into them. They're not perfect. There's a lot better photographers out there than me for sure. I'm still an amateur and new at this, but I'm really happy with the product and that's enough. And if I upload it and nobody likes it, that's okay. Like as long as I love the photo and, and that happens. I think it happens for multitude of reasons. Can always be the algorithm. It can be, yeah. well, it could be there's not a good photo, but it could also be that there's a, a character that people don't really know. You know, people really love yeah. Batman photos. People love Spider Man photos. People may not love, uh, you know, Shinji from a random show. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but if I like the photo, I upload it. Yeah. And and my mentality is that like every day's a new day. It's awesome. Like every day's a new opportunity to upload something and see if anyone's digging it. And if not, there'll be another chance tomorrow. It's totally fine. And so that's kind of been my goal and is to just be happy with the, the content that I make for myself, to really do it for myself. And then if, if people enjoy it, that's awesome. But if not, that's okay because I'm still, I'm excited about it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, when you said that about ha- having a certain video or something that you were really proud of and everything and I was thinking about my apartment tour video yeah. that I made by the midsummer. It had been three weeks of just preparing everything, just trying to get the place done yeah. because I, I don't know how, how long, ever long I will stay in this apartment, whether yeah. we go out for a new job, me and my spouse. And by that, I wanted to document it really fast and get done with it. So I felt that we we have lived in this space and it has been done for as long as it could be. Yeah. Uh, and the video, of course, took 
just as long filming oh, and God. editing because I mean, I wanted to capture different lights and everything just like with your photography and everything. Yeah. You want to get a certain mood out of it. Yeah. And then, of course, I, I never did hit the YouTube trending stride with that video, but <laughs> I'm still very happy with it because it's bare. Yeah. And if that ever would happen, that a video would stand out to be viral. All yeah. the other stuff is already there. Yeah, to that's be exactly noticed. Right. That's exactly right. And the YouTube specifically is just an it's just an algorithm and a numbers game of like consistently putting out videos, and eventually the YouTube will just show it to more and more people. And uh, it just it takes time, energy, dedication, and a little luck, and of course yeah. uh, some good content. But it's one of those things where if you make a YouTube video or any type of content really and you're doing it because you either want money or you want fame yeah both of which are going to leave you feeling very empty <laughs> because yeah it yeah, just, yeah it almost it has never to be more, it has to be something else yeah you have to have that creative drive or that drive to do it for yourself and to put content out there i think for me when i make youtube videos over on super squad d if it's a pre-recorded video i just always want to make myself laugh if I can make myself laugh and have a good time doing it and think something is funny, whether it's a dumb cutaway gag or whether it's something <laughs> I say, or whether it's an accident and I say something stupid, like if I can enjoy it and laugh, that's really the metric for me to say, okay, I can upload this. I feel good about this video. Like it's totally fine. Uh, and, and whether or not people watch it, like that's okay. That's good. That, that's the right mentality to go into this. And as you said, the content should really come first before the medium not yeah. just showing up and then, okay, uh, audience, what am I supposed to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> it should really, it should really come from you yeah. and your message and what you want to put out there. Definitely. Cause I, one of the things I found is like the world is huge and there are other people who will like your stuff. There are other people who will like you as a person. They'll like what you're putting out and they'll like your stuff it just may take a while to connect with those people. So like if you're an exactly. early on YouTuber and you're just starting your channel, like hang in there. You, you keep putting out content. People are going to find you and they're going to dig it. You're going to find your crowd. People are going to enjoy what you're doing. Just keep making it, man. Just keep making it. You have another channel as well. I mean, where you put out videos before, right? Yeah. So we did, I did super squad D four years ago now with a buddy of mine. And we ended up just doing like, talk shows and some reviews and stuff like that. And it was fun, but we eventually just kind of got exhausted and work and life got kind of crazy. So we didn't really do anything on it yeah. until uh, really earlier this year when we started back up. Once the pandemic hit, we were like, you know what, let's just get back in there. Let's make some content. And we've just been having a blast ever since doing, doing videos. But uh, I also had a personal channel, which was a vlog that I also really enjoyed doing because I really enjoy making movies and filmmaking. Yeah. The only problem with that was it was extremely draining for me I because see. I was, I, I bit off more than I could chew. I was trying to do one a day. I was ah. trying to vlog every day and that was just un, unsustainable. But what's interesting about the vlogs and this kind of speaks to like why you make content and depends on the content you make and the reasoning. But for me, those vlogs have become a real source of joy for our family because they captured a moment in time, even if it was just a random day of the week, yeah. they captured a moment in time that we can go back and watch and really enjoy. Like my daughter, I set out to make the vlogs because I thought, you know what? I want to make these some one day my daughter can watch these. Yeah. And, and she's six now and she loves watching them. She'll <laughs> go back and she's watched them all 50 times. She's probably all the views on the vlogs, all of them is her nice. just rewatching them. But she loves it. She looks at it like we did a birthday vlog. We went to a fun place. So as exhausting as it is, and it is very exhausting, uh, I, it's something I wish I would take more time to do. In fact, I recorded all the footage from me at Galaxy's Edge this summer from Star yeah. Wars and with the intent to make it into a vlog. And I just I haven't done it. So I need, I need to do it. And you get in there and do it because it'd be if for no other reason, a fun snapshot of our family. I mean, I've done the same thing, making some vlogs, but then never uploaded them because I made those for me as well yeah. as they work for practice. Also yeah. trying to find 
different stuff, what you can do with it and everything. And with a vlog, it's always on the go also. It's not yeah, as yeah. pre-planned. You can plan your trip, of course, with I want to have this, this, and this shot. Yeah. And then I'll fill in the blanks. But, I mean, it's much more spur of a moment and Absolutely. see what happens. And it's also the being comfortable with being in a open space with other people that might wonder why you're speaking to your phone or yeah, your if camera. you hold your phone like this and you're you know uh, talking to it, people definitely definitely look and and I think it's interesting. And for when I was vlogging, I was using a a, a, a bigger camera, not like a huge camera, but like a DSLR, yeah, uh, or a mirrorless camera. And so I had like the the Joby tripod that was like pointed back at me, and I'm walking around with a microphone on the top, and I'm setting it up, and then walking into shots and things like that. But it was it was it was fun, but it was very spur of the moment, and you. That was part of the joy and the challenge for me going back to trying to find that creative outlet that I really have enjoyed with toy photography is the, the vlogs. One of the things that they shared in common for me was, and same with YouTube and super squad D is I really find a lot of joy in creating on the fly and, yeah. and seeing what happens and, and challenging myself to turn it into something that people would want to watch. So like whenever I make a video, I never think about what I'm going to say beforehand, which is probably why okay. I'm saying so much stupid stuff. But like I never <laughs> think like, OK, I'm going to sit down and do this review and I want to talk about these four points. I want to do this. I just turn the camera on and go. We and are. That ends up being really fun for me to try to make it into something. And, and, and thank goodness that editing exists <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many things that get cut and moved around. But. We're solar opposites, dude. I mean, I script all of my videos now, except for my review videos that I do each yeah. month. But then I've already written a review on Goodreads for those yeah, books. Yeah. So I sort of scripted so kind of what know. I want to say. But you can already. tell you're so professional. That's why your channel's so good. You're so professional. You have so much to good things to say. I'm just a bumbling idiot up there. <laughs> Thanks, man. But I mean, I mean... I'm such a control freak. That's really it. Yeah. And I should really do a video about that says that I have issues, but not the issues that you think <laughs> with, it, with it being a comic book channel and everything. Oh, but I mean, I great. have control issues, I think. And I love we, we, that's why we do this pre-recorded because I want to have it uploaded in a timely fashion of being once a week. Yeah. Because I, I made, let's see here. This is the first interview this week when we made it but i've actually gonna pre-record three other interviews coming up this i'm so glad i'm the week. first i feel so i so i feel so i feel so honored to be the first this week i think uh, yeah exactly and i think this is episode 10 out of awesome. the, the total so far and i don't even know i don't have a set number goal i'll yeah. just keep on going as long as people want to talk to me, I guess. That's so awesome. Well, dude, I, you know I love talking to you. If you ever want to have me back on, all you have to do is ask. I would love to be here. You're fun to hang out with. For those who, who don't know, you got to hang out with this guy. He's awesome. Super fun. Thank you. And call you, I will do. And Let's see here. I have some more questions here. I mean, this is pretty obvious. You used to. Yep. Loved, loved going to a convention before COVID and now that COVID is it. <laughs> of course. Um, you know, where we live though, there's really not many conventions. There are, there's oh. one comic book convention, which we uploaded a video of us trying to go this past summer to yeah, the, I saw it. The, the convention. Uh, it did not go as planned, but we, we actually today, I believe as of today. So it's probably up already. I'm getting ready to upload. Uh, we went to a little toy convention that okay. ended up being a blast uh, around us. And there's another one coming up this fall that we will go to, assuming COVID allows. So we'll, we will see how that goes. But uh, I love a good convention. It's just what super is, fun. What's the first thing you do when you get in there? Unless it's like go to the bathroom or the closet or anything. I, I mean, what's the first thing you seek out? I usually want to go look at stuff more than like creators. Like I want to go to the booths and check out like all the stuff they have for sale. See if I can find any good deals, like look for the, through the figures, 
look for good omnibus deals that I might be missing. Those are that's really my first thing that I want to do, as opposed to meeting creators and things like that, which I do like to do. Um, the last convention I went to, I don't I don't th think of myself as someone who gets starstruck. I've okay. met a handful of stars over the course of my life and had no problem. Like I didn't get awkward. I didn't, I didn't feel like maybe, maybe I was awkward. <laughs> maybe I was like super awkward. Maybe like, but for some reason, the power ranger actors are just Which like, like Everyone? I can meet Brad Pitt and be like, what's up, bro? How's it going? Good to meet you, man. But <laughs> seeing a power ranger actor in person, I was just like, like I, I remember I was going to the convention. There was uh the second red ranger. He played Rocky. He was also in the Power Rangers movie, and his name is Steve Cardenia. Super nice guy, I'm told. But no, <laughs> because I'm standing about 20 feet from him. I'm just standing there going, just staring at him. And he looked at him, and I got him, and he was like, and I just went, oh. <laughs> and then, and then I was, my friend Joseph was like, why don't you go talk to him? I was like, I can't. I can't, I can't do it. And then I just walked off. Oh so, God. Best was, moment uh, that Tyler ever had. It was, it was very meaningful. It was very meaningful. But uh, we're best friends basically. Yeah, so that's the point of the story. That Steve <laughs> and I are best friends. I mean, we had that one interaction and I feel like we're best friends. So. I mean, I like I, I like whenever I meet, if they're a celebrity profile, I, I like how, they are used to handling people and fans and everything. And they yeah. have developed a sort of manner because there's of course, both sides of the spectrum, but, but I like when suddenly I, I'm there in front of them. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen is the first one that comes to mind. Uh, yeah. Of course, the actor playing Hannibal. He's so awesome in the series. Yeah. You know, he's, he's Danish. So it's, and Danes can speak Swedish pretty much fluently if they want to. Yeah. That sort of freaked me out because <laughs> I noticed, I, 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 I said to myself, I'll finish off the, the series before I watch any extra material or interviews because I don't want to, um, you know, burst the bubble of the character that he has embraced yeah. with Hannibal because he's so good. So good. Rewatch that series like, six times I, so I, swear, I swear and when i met him i think it was like hi joachim what do you want oh and what do you want me to sign and everything okay here's first season of hannibal and everything shook my hand i think once when we said hello and once when we said goodbye all of a sudden i was just standing there with my signed edition on the side and the next one was already there in front of me wow. and i mean didn't get much talking maybe but yeah i, I liked how it just yeah you know just fluently uh, suddenly i'm there it's done and everything <laughs> and they handled it in, in a good mannerism yeah so yeah uh, you can tell that they are used to this to get it all going i like that so, so what is the first thing you do at a con when you get to a con where's the first place you're gonna go I, i'm ready and set and go with my camera already yeah you're ready to film. I, I could see that about you. You got, you, I know you've got ideas about what you want to film when you get yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. You know. And even more ideas now with my new camera and everything. I feel that I get much more richer colors and depth. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I'll even bring more stuff. Maybe even my camera slider to get some slide shots as well, be because awesome. it's always static shots or just yeah. turning around panoramic with the tripod. But I want to get out more, but that means also more days yeah. to attend. Yeah. And I, I'm going to take some time off just to be able to be there all three days. I actually yeah. got a, a press card now so that I can attend for free on That's the Swedish. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I signed up with my YouTube channel name and I emailed them and said, is this good for entering? the convention the whole weekend and they said yes amazing that's so awesome and i mean i didn't thought it would be that simple because i tried I to do the same thing i sent them my youtube channel and they said oh for you the price doubled you know <laughs> the price of two tickets we didn't know it was you yeah but but it doesn't feel like they screened me or anything when i said that it was for the youtube channel so but awesome, i guess yeah. any press is good press for yeah them. yeah true that true that 
So even if you just sign up maybe with your Instagram account, I guess you'll document it in some way or form and spread the word that for next year, maybe people, yeah. will, more people I'll, will attend. I'll try, man. I'm going to give that a try. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And yeah, so I basically, I go there with a couple of friends of mine. And as soon as we're in there, I say, okay, I'm going to go check out the whole place. Bye. <laughs> see you guys. We'll meet up later. Yeah, I'll probably see you two or three times. You'll see me filming and then yeah. we'll meet up again. That's so so funny, I, I, I take a huge lap in several. I've tried to find the biggest spot or the highest spot, I would say, and try to, okay, bear, I want to go in bear. Yeah. And if you're lucky, you're in bear very much earlier. Yeah. Before there's people everywhere and you'll get, be able to go and get those close shots before and cool. wide shots before there's people in the way also right yeah no doubt. so uh, just like with my room tour mm -hmm. here at home in my apartment and everything i i knew some shots that i really wanted ahead of time and of course mm -hmm. helps with the scheduling and everything you know the parades and everything that the conventions have yep no doubt the scheduling is a huge part of going to conventions knowing like what's gonna happen when yeah, I mean, I think the last time I went was 2018. I missed the second two because mm. with my location of study and everything was, it was just not manageable and skipping school. I, I, I wasn't up for that. And, and that. Uh, so I missed out on that. But uh, with that convention, I missed out on pretty much every panel because I was just running around <laughs> filming. So at one point, I think I was like one minute late and the door shut in my face, basically. Oh, and you can't, sucks. they can't no open one. up because they're in the middle of their story where yeah. people are settling down. And it's the atmosphere. It's like theater all over yeah. again with Spider-Man 2 or Spider-Man oh, 3. <laughs> the pain. The pain. I love it, dude. Yeah, let's see here. Um, but about the community and everything. And you, the comic book community and YouTube comic book community overall, what is the best thing do you think about it? I think it's just, you know, finding ways to torture Omar from Near Me Condition <laughs> and Jess Bragg from Omni Dog's Vault certainly seems to be the highlight of the entire community for me personally. Uh, I'm I'm in a group chat with those guys and we have some fun. No, I think for me, the, I think it's just connecting with people. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, the world is a huge place. There are yeah. people who share your same passions. And so finding other people who are passionate, not only about comic books, which is something that we're all passionate about and love, but are passionate about creative content making it's almost like a subgenre of comic book collecting. So yeah. it's like you can really narrow in on who you feel like you can relate to and who can relate to you as a person by connecting with other content creators. And so for me, it's just finding that camaraderie and, and people who share the same passions that I share. I know that like you and I both could probably sit here and talk about for hours about our favorite filmmaking techniques and films we love to watch and filming and what we do for shots and wide shots and close shots and our different lens choices and color grading styles. And that's just so awesome that we can share that specific of, uh, of, of hobbies where it's not just about the comic books, but it's about content creation. And then of course, yeah. as well, the audience and people who watch, I, the thing I love more than anything is just engaging with people. Like really, yeah. I love to put myself out there to be a little bit vulnerable and to show like, Hey, this is who I am. And then to find people who say, I resonate with that. Like I want to yeah. connect with that and to be able to connect through the screen to people who are watching my content and to build a community in that way is so awesome. Like I love when I'm doing a live stream and like you pop in or someone else that I recognize from the community pops in. It's just, it, it really makes me feel like we're all friends and we all are, shared sharing this hobby in this community it's just it's something special that it's hard to put into words but really uh is a big part of my life now yeah and I, as you said communicate with people i feel that i mean it's not real the view number that i think about i think about the comments absolutely totally agree with that i would rather have a live stream with 10 people who are 
actively engaging that we are hanging out. Yeah. Then I would rather have a stream with a thousand people of people who are just watching. Yeah. Like, and just silence. And just not right. I would way rather have the 10 who are engaging because to me, that's what I want. Like I want to connect with people. And yeah. so that is much more important to me than the numbers of subscribers or views or anything like that, for sure. Yeah. Because like, like for example, uh, I had, I've had a few videos over on Instagram go over a hundred thousand, which is great. Like yeah. that's, I'm super thankful for that. Yeah. But I have gotten way more joy and satisfaction from the live streams where I've had 10 people. Yeah. Because I, I'm connecting with those people, I feel like, in a way that's more than just them going, oh, that was a video I watched, you know? Mm -hmm. Because 100,000 viewers won't comment. Right. Yeah. I'm not connecting with those people in that way. You know, like hopefully they enjoyed the content, which is great, but I want to connect with the community. That's yeah. that's really what I want. And so I love that this community is. And one of the things that I've I've said before that I'll continue to say is I think this is one of the best communities on social media because there's very little toxicity amongst content yeah. creators. Now I'm sure there are some, and maybe if I had a bigger channel and I was, I don't know, I'm not personally friends with a lot of the bigger channels, I but mean, in it terms is, of it's so behind what? the scenes, if it is, yeah. it's behind the scenes. Exactly. Because like for, for everybody I know and connect with, man, we all just get along. Like we all have a good time. We all like each other. We all, want to build each other up you know there's in a lot of communities there's this idea that it's a zero-sum game where it's like okay well i have to get all the subscribers and views which means you can't because i need them and they got to be mine and i want to have this idea for my channel and i want to do this and it's like i don't feel like our community is that way at all because it's it's a space where i think if anyone does well we all do well yeah. because we all just want the community to grow like i love seeing new channels i love seeing people grow i love people's success stories I, I want everybody to do well because there's room for everybody in the community. And if you're watching this and you're at home and you're like, I'm thinking about making a channel, there's room for you. Yeah. You have a unique perspective and point of view and you should make a channel and come hang out with us and join up with us. We'd love to have you and we'd love to uh, share this awesome community. That's that, exactly. And success, whole different topic also. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because however you think of success is how you can push yourself or feel that you have succeeded. Yeah. Because going back to all the things that we said, big house, two cars, huge comic book collection. Yeah. It's all different on what you find is successful. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't have the biggest YouTube channel, but I have great connections and great friends. And yeah. that is what makes me rich. And I haven't read everything but I've read some things and they struck deeper than any yeah. other content. And yeah. so you get to choose really in short summary, what your definition of success is. And if success is having to commute with 10 people on something that you share, mm -hmm. that is much more worthy than 100,000 silent ones. Agree. Totally. A hundred percent. I have one or two more standard questions yeah, that I great. used to do. And then after that, I'll probably will have to go, unfortunately. Yeah. It's curses right. work. You have been a delight. Oh man, I love this. I love just hanging out. It's fun, dude. Thank you for having me on. Let's see here. So this sort of a two part question. I guess it depends on how you see it. <laughs> what makes you a comic book fan and how would you describe your fandom? I mean, if it all goes into one or if it's two different questions overall, I don't know. Yeah, I think that uh, there's something that we all resonate with a little bit as comic book fans, and that is the idea of escapism. And we were talking about this before, and and I think that one of the things we all love to do is escape to a world that is fantastic and magical or mysterious De depends on what genre you like, but we all find a joy in escaping to a reality where things are different. And that's not, a, I don't mean that in a bad way. No, uh, of course not. I mean that in a way where it's like, 
it's so fun to me to read about characters with fantastical powers and cool lives and doing all this like crazy stuff. And, and it's not always good stuff, but it is always interesting to me. And whether you're a comic book fan or whether you're a fan of TV shows or movies or books without pictures, I don't know who'd be a fan of that. Cause like, what's the point? If there's no pictures, <laughs> why read it? But you know, this idea that you can escape to another world that is rich and vibrant and full of life and full of characters that you love and connect with. I think to me, that is what really draws me in. And I think that draws a lot of people in, especially as the world gets crazy, like with the pandemic and things yeah. like that. Comic books are a great outlet to escape to, to read something that is fun and just kind of takes you out of, out of some of the hard parts of life for a little while. It's, it's really a joy. And of course, then we talked a lot about connection and I think connecting with characters that resonate with you and your values and who you are as a person or who you want to be or the struggles that they struggle with, that you struggle with. I think all of those things, when you can find something to connect to is really wonderful. And I, and I think that to me, those to me are the characters that I really enjoy the most reading that I can connect to and that I can escape to. I like that. I mean, as you said, it's not a bad word, escapism. Right. Uh, but I like how pretty much everyone that has answered this question has summarized their feelings with just one word. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, there's definitely a, a joy for me there in finding new worlds and new characters to love and latch on to and, yeah. and think about for a while. It's just, it's really fun for me. My job is very uh, mundane. So I end up just looking at a screen and, and oh. working with numbers all day. So for me to escape to a world that is fantastic and magical and Colorful. there's a lot of exciting going on. It's just so much, so much joy for me to, to do for sure. Great. Okay. I have one more question. This should be a very easy one. Believe okay. me. Okay. Where can people find you? Uh, it's the hardest question ever. <laughs> uh, you can find me on YouTube at super squad D where the D stands for, this is a great discussion, dude. I love being here. Thank you a ton for having me. You can find my toy photography on Instagram. It's at SSD toys where I mentioned earlier, but I upload a new figure photo almost every day and a behind the scenes video as well. So I just, I'm having a blast doing that and I'm going to continue doing the YouTube thing because I also have a blast doing that. Uh, occasionally you can find me on other comic book channels like this one or honor bros live or near me condition, things like that. And I'm on Facebook, uh, not as much anymore, but I am in the Omnibus Collectors comic swapping community as well as a couple other Omnibus related uh, pages. So it's a good time, man. Thank you so much for having me on. This was just a joy. This is a big highlight of my week. I look forward to this all weekend and I'm super excited to be here and, and film it and talk. Thank you. you. This has been super fun, man. And of course, links to as much as I can down below in, in, in the description. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No worries, man. No worries. Yes, thank, thank you for being here with me, Matt. Thank you. And to all of you that have been watching, thank you for doing so. This has been a great discussion, I think. And one and a half hours has never <laughs> seemed shorter. Dude, it flew by. It did. I looked down. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have so many calls. But uh, yeah, it's this is awesome, man. I look forward to doing this again sometime for sure. Definitely. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for watching. See you later. Bye-bye.